Story recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain an adventure in sci-fi film called 2001, A Space Odyssey. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. In the dawn of man, only shrubs and giant rock formations can be seen for miles over the desert. The gushes of winds and birds chirping start the morning. The sun fully rises, and there appears apes hiding behind a shadow of a boulder. Creatures resembling anteaters live harmoniously with the apes. The silence is deafening, and only the hostile grunts of the apes disrupt it. Peace, serenity, and boredom radiate from the environment. The most exciting thing happening is two apes picking off bugs from one another. A feline ambushes an unsuspecting ape, jumping onto it and latching its sharp teeth into the flesh. The rest of the apes howl at the sight of their comrade getting killed. Near a water deposit, a group of apes is seen cleaning themselves and drinking from the muddy pond. A scream-off begins as a rival tribe confronts them. Their hostility and anger are showing, but no one makes any violent move. A few strained throats later, the rival tribe successfully drives the other apes off, leaving the pond all to themselves. The day ends, and the land grows quieter than before. The apes are in their caves, waiting for the sun to fall. As they open their eyes, something disgruntles them. They make their way out to see an unknown structure. Their suspiciousness quickly turns into curiosity as more and more apes try to touch and inspect the strange structure. However, nothing came of it. A lone ape scavenges a pile of bones and grabs a sturdy piece. It starts to hammer down the rest of the bones, discovering the power of tools. The ape continues to furiously smash the bones to pieces, practicing as if the bones are a real creature. With this newfound knowledge, the ape hunts an animal and eats it. The concept of using bones as weapons quickly spread throughout the ape colony, allowing for hunting to become a new source of food. A new day comes, and it starts with an eventful setting as two tribes of apes are once again in a conflict. However, this time, one colony has the upper hand. An unlucky ape tries to get near the ape with a weapon without knowing that it will take its last step and final cry. This scares off the rest of the rival apes, ensuring their spot at the top of the food chain. In outer space, a satellite surveys Earth. A spacecraft appears, and the interior of it resembles an airplane. There sits a man named Floyd, a doctor of astronautics, who's sleeping while the movie he's watching continues to play. A woman enters the cabin wearing an all-white uniform with grip shoes, allowing her to stay on her feet and not float all over the place because of the zero gravity. The spacecraft arrives at the space station, and Floyd walks into the main level. He talks to the receptionist that knows who he already is. Floyd asks for Mr. Miller of station security for their meeting. Miller conveniently walks in and shakes the hand of Floyd. After a bit of small talk, Floyd proceeds to use a voice print identification machine. There he states his personal information and his destination, which is the moon. The two catch up with one another, but Floyd interrupts, saying he has to make a phone call. He slips a card into a machine and dials a number. His daughter appears on the screen. She asks if Floyd can come to her birthday tomorrow. He apologetically says he can't. They say their goodbyes, and as the screen turns off, the girl is seen with a huge smile on her face. Floyd then reconnects with a good friend named Elena. After an exchange of compliments, Elena introduces Floyd to her colleagues. He sits down and mingles with the group. Floyd says that he'll be going to a place called Clavius. Out of curiosity, a man questions him about the strange things happening there. However, Floyd portrays that he isn't aware of anything, but it seems as though he just isn't allowed to discuss details about it. The man iterates that they haven't contacted the station at Clavius for the past 10 days. They discuss a few more strange events about the place, like a rampant epidemic spreading, prompting Floyd to leave and go on his way. While flying to the moon, Floyd takes a nap in his seat. The flight stewardess distributes containers of food that are dispensed through straws to everyone on the ship. Everything on board displays countless interesting innovations, magnifying the futuristic aspects that are present at the time. Finally, they land on the moon. Distinguished people are all present in a room waiting for a meeting to start. Halverson introduces Floyd to the group, he stands and makes his way to the podium. In his speech, he addresses the masking of what's genuinely happening in Clavius. A cover-up story of an epidemic hides the truth of the discoveries of the group in Clavius. This is to keep the secrecy of the extremely sensitive information. Floyd's agenda is to gather the information that he will then report to the National Council. This will help in formulating a plan on if and how they shall publicize the news. After a few questions from the audience, Floyd steps down the podium, and the meeting advances with the briefing. A team, including Floyd and Halverson, are on a vessel heading to an excavation site. 
The group talks about this structure they found underneath the moon's surface. It is a structure that produces a strong radio signal and doesn't seem to be naturally buried, causing their speculation. After a few bites of their sandwiches and a cup of coffee, they reach their destination. They feel an ominous vibe while walking down the excavation site, and the heavy tension weighs them down more than the spacesuits they wear. A familiar structure meets the group at the bottom of the site. They stand side to side in front of the monolith, getting ready for their picture to be taken. Suddenly, they hear a high pitch ringing noise. 18 months later, a spacecraft floats through space, embarking on the Jupiter mission. A man named Dr. Frank Poole jogs along the floor in the ceiling of a circular room. He eats his food with the mission commander, Dr. David Bowman, while watching the BBC channel. The show features their team, the crew of Discovery One. They're on a half a billion mile voyage to Jupiter, with three of the crew members put in a hibernating state. And HAL. HAL is short for HAL 9000, a supercomputer that controls the entire system of the spacecraft. It's able to mimic human functions, forming some sort of consciousness. It completes tasks at unimaginable speeds without any error. After a while, Hal alerts Frank of the incoming transmission from his parents. It's his birthday and a recorded message displays on the screen. Frank's parents relay all the greetings from relatives and friends. The warm messages from his parents and friends don't seem to affect Frank in any way. He shows no signs of interest or gratitude and gets back to relaxing. Hal initiates a conversation with David, it asks him if he can show his drawings of the ship and the crewmates. A little into the conversation, Hal questions David if he has any second thoughts about the mission. David asks how it came up with that. Hal, sounding like it isn't a computer, credits the question to its doubts. They talk about the uncertainty and the looming stories behind the mission. Hal also mentions the strange structure on the moon and the unconventional preparations for the journey. A fault in a unit in the spacecraft abruptly interrupts the discussion. Failure is imminent, and they have 72 hours to fix it. David acts quickly and informs Mission Control and Frank about the problem. David prepares for extravehicular activity and enters the pod that Hal set up for him. His eyes show determination and focus. The bay door opens, and he makes his way to the area of the damaged unit. He carefully soars through the darkness of space, replacing the unit successfully. David returns to the spacecraft and checks the damaged unit with Frank and Hal. However, they soon find out that there isn't anything wrong with it. Hal sounds puzzled and suggests returning the supposedly damaged unit for the system to fail, so they can find out what's wrong with it. The two report the happenings to Mission Control. Mission Control agrees to return the unit for failure analysis. However, they also inform the two that Hal made an error. As another Hal 9000 on their end computes a different conclusion. Sounding apologetic, Hal asks the two if what happened raises concern. David replies no but then asks for an explanation of why Hal and the other Hal 9000 differ in results. Without any hesitation, Hal replies that human error is the only possible cause. It then assures that the 9000 series computers possess a perfect record. Frank is doubtful, but David stops the conversation before it escalates. David and Frank check back on the pod. They enter together, making sure Hal can't hear them. They discuss their thoughts about Hal, both expressing their doubts and worries. Frank senses something odd about Hal. But with a level-headed mind, David decides to carry on with the failure analysis. Frank points out that if the unit doesn't fail, something is wrong with Hal. And if that's the case, then their only choice will be to cut off Hal from the ship's system. Not unless Hal does that to them first. This time around, Frank is the one that will return the damaged unit to its place. A few moments pass since Frank set out. The pod begins to turn slowly, and as Frank breathes harder and harder, the pod moves closer and closer, flashing a red light that indicates that Hal seizes control of it. David looks out a window but doesn't see a flailing Frank pass through. His air hose is cut off, meaning he's slowly suffocating to death as he and the pod get lost in space. David is unaware of the situation. He even asks Hal to prepare a pod to check on Frank. David enters the pod, not knowing he might suffer the same fate. He moves farther and farther away from the spacecraft, trying to track Frank's pod using the radar. And there in the window, a yellow speck is seen in the vast darkness. David approaches to retrieve Frank's body. His calm manner remains but the frustration, sadness, and fear are evident in his eyes. Hal is alone back at the ship. It uses this opportunity to disable the life support systems of the crew members killing the unconscious souls. No remorse can be seen from the red dot. Returning from his search, David asks Hal to open the bay doors. However, Hal doesn't respond immediately. After a few moments, Hal says that he can't open the hatch, 
to which David responds by asking what the problem is. However, deep down, he knows what the problem is, and so does Hal. Hal explains that it can't let anyone jeopardize the mission. It knows about what he and Frank are planning to do regardless of not hearing them talk. Because of this, Hal is left with no choice but to eliminate them. Feeling hopeless, David lets a lifeless Frank drift off into space. And with nothing left to lose, he tries to open the emergency airlock. However, David can't just enter easily without a helmet. So he parks precisely where the entrance of the ship meets the opening of the pod. He presses three buttons, causing an alarm to go off that's labeled armed. He ducks down, revealing a caution sign which reads explosive bolts. He braces himself and gets flung into the ship. While holding his breath, he pulls on a latch closing the entrance. David walks through the corridors of the spacecraft, and Hal asks what he plans to do, but he ignores it. He grabs a master key and inserts it into the logic memory center of Hal. The pleats of Hal don't reach David at all, and with a few turns of the key he finally opens the hatch. Hal calls out for David to stop, but no words will halt him from what he plans to do. He pulls out the drives in the internal terminal of Hal's system. With every screw, Hal's voice grows quieter and quieter. It reminisces its memories, acting out a computer's version of life flashing before its eyes. David entertains Hal for the last time and asks him to sing the song Hal mentions was taught to him by its creator. Hal obliges, creepily singing as he drifts to insentience. A voice startles David. A video recording plays, and what's seen on the screen is a familiar sight. It's Floyd, saying something about what happened 18 months ago. He announces that the structure buried under the moon's surface is the first discovery of intelligent life outside Earth. The black monolith has no defining physical characteristic. However, it emits a strong radio signal to Jupiter, hence why Discovery 1 is heading there. Rising above the horizon is the planet Jupiter and the spacecraft closing in on its destination. A black rectangular figure orbits Jupiter. It blends in with the darkness of space, making it seem invisible. Light reflects upon it, realizing that it's a replica of the monolith on the moon. The bay doors of the ship open, and the pod approaches the gas giant. Flashes of light pass David as he nears the surface. He experiences heavy turbulence, his skin stretches out, and every organ in his body displaces itself. The lights grow brighter, forming mesmerizing patterns. It almost seems endless. David finds himself in random positions throughout this trip. His eyes show fear and, at the same time, excitement for what he's about to discover. Calm waves of light flowing along with darkness replace the colorful lights. Finally, the surface of the planet can be seen. David travels the lands, deserts, and oceans of Jupiter. His blinking intensifies, and he looks as if he went to hell and back. The pod lays in a bedroom filled with classy furniture and fixtures. David breathes but is far from being stable. Meanwhile, someone stands outside in the room wearing a spacesuit. The man is David looking much older, and the pod disappears into thin air. He walks into a bathroom, where he looks at himself in the mirror, observing his wrinkly skin. He turns to see a man eating. The man stands up and walks towards the bathroom. He is David, now even older than before. David gets back to his dinner, taking a sip of his drink. The glass falls due to his clumsiness. He isn't the man he once was, and as he looks towards the bed, this becomes even clearer. There lies David in his deathbed, pointing at the black monolith. With just a look away, the old, weak, and fragile man that lies in bed is replaced by a newborn with a border of light surrounding him. David is the baby reborn as a star. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.